Hey guys, Henning and Morton from Flip Normals here. In this video, we are going to be talking about smart materials in Substance Painter and how people are pretty much abusing the system and not using it to its full potential at all. What we're seeing a lot is that you have people who they get their hands on Painter and they just start going crazy. You know, they they go in and they just drag and drop some smart materials onto their objects and they're looking at this and being like, this is super cool. <laughs> And, and yeah, yeah, it is super cool. These materials, which ship with Painter, they're phenomenal. But one of the problems is, particularly if you're a student, is that we've seen this actually, where you can actually identify which smart materials different people are using. So if, you, if you're reviewing a showreel which has textures or a game reel or whatever it might be, now, you, if you're hiring a texture artist, you don't want to be able to identify what presets they're using. Because you're not hiring somebody for the purposes of dragging and dropping smart materials. Drag and drop a mask, there you go, that's the <laughs> yeah, job done. That's it. If an asset took you five minutes to paint, you know, you're not going to put that in a reel. So this here is is kind of to talk about that. Talk about smart material abuse. And uh, leave the smart materials alone. <laughs> yeah. How to, how to use more hand painting and observation and more storytelling instead of just go crazy drag and drop. Yeah. Because like... Each, I mean, we've talked about these things a lot, um, but you know, each object that you're texturing or you're sculpting or whatever you're doing to it has a story. And it's very important to try and convey that story in whatever you're doing. There's a reason why if you use the machinery smart material that it looks like that, but it's not gonna apply to all objects because not all objects have been through the same stuff. No, exactly. There's such a big difference if you have it's a brand new fire hydrant or it's a fire hydrant which has been there for 60 years. Yeah. It's not the same one. So, I mean, I'm all for using uh, materials or smart materials as a base because I mean, why redo something which has already been done? If you can get a base of steel by dragging steel and I mean, cool. Yeah. That, that's a great start. But we're going to be looking at something which a lot of people screw up, which is, you know, they make a, they make some a basic material like this to make some red paint, to make it, uh, make it pretty shiny, to make give some some height, and now you go and you make a mask for it. We assume you know all this. If you don't, we have an introduction to Painter coming out. Oh, very soon. Oh, actually. very soon. So this is this is the starting point. I see a bunch of people get to where you know they have they have an asset and very quickly you know essentially within 30 seconds you can get something which it looks it looks pretty cool but clearly it's not done you see here that the distance between all all the all the, the curvatures here is exactly the same and everything just looks very uniform and that's because it is because it's based on a curvature map which is uniform this doesn't take anything into account such as the storytelling. This purely looks at the curvature maps and makes a material or makes a mask out of that. Yeah, and this is what this video is about, trying to get away from relying too much on everything being procedural. Proceduralness is awesome for iterations, but not everything needs to be completely 100% iterative. Like, there's no. so, I mean, most of what we do needs to be bespoke. So starting off with a base that's procedural is amazing because it means that you can get up to a really high level really quickly, and then you're supposed to do your job afterwards. Exactly. And if you're in a project and you've got to texture a bunch of different objects which are similar, you have 40 fire hydrants, and you need to <laughs> texture them. I mean, definitely spend some time on making the procedural element as good as possible. Yeah. But then afterwards, then you go in and, and you add individual variation. So for this for this thing here to exist in real life, like this, that's somebody has gone over and scraped off the paint <laughs> perfectly, perfectly, <laughs> and then it there's it's been out in the weather and just had a tiny bit of variation to it. Yeah, this it, it, stuff just doesn't look like something like this. Stuff has variation in it. We uh, I think we mentioned this before in one of our videos, but when we went to Hong Kong some months ago, now we saw this with a lot of. Um, a lot of statues. People have been touching their mm. feet and heads in certain points, and they were far shinier in those areas yeah. than the other, <laughs> the other ones. And that's purely storytelling. That's because people believe, but touching these areas, it brings them luck or whatever it might be. So first, you got to think about the story of your object. Like, does a fire hydrant bring you good luck if you keep <laughs> rubbing it on the top? Exactly. Maybe. There might be. There might be things like that. Yeah. 
So let's look at some specifics of what we're talking about. So first off, whenever we're doing this, I would just go in add a paint layer and then just clean up the mask in certain areas. You can see here that there's still like remnants left off of the red material on the very metallic chains here. So we can use uh, this tool to just drag and drag and fill in these layers. This is a really, really cool tool. So set this to set this to um, the polyfill mode, the mesh fill mode, and then we can just start to drag in. You can see what it's doing. It just takes a polygon object and fills it in. Excellent for cleanup. Excellent for cleanup. Because you know you you most likely don't have spill of paint on in these areas. <laughs> right at the tip of uh, the chains. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Probably not. So then we can go back in again, and uh, we. Uh, Let's just check. Uh, we need our we need our shelf back because we need to use brushes for this. So one brush I really enjoyed using is brush two. All the br the dirt brushes are pretty good. You don't want to use something like uh, the soft brushes for this because this is just too generic. You want to have something which has some bit of texture in it, like this. Yeah, and then like you consider you consider different parts of the in this case fire hydrant. You know, the base might be I don't know more damaged because people kick it, or uh, maybe there was a car that ran into it yeah. in, from the side ones. Um, a lot of people work uh, around the va valves if they need to open or close them a lot. So you know those areas might be more damaged because there's been wrenches and stuff around it. Yeah, so areas which would be damaged would be around around here, like this here. I mean, obviously this is a more simple example. You wouldn't have perfect metal and then just paint. You would have a bunch of dirt and grime. Yeah, and then some so, of the steel would be rusty now. Exactly. And... So, but this is just to have a clear example, a simple example showing you that you really just have to go in and add variation to where stuff would be. So for instance, around, around this, this area, you know, you can probably paint it all away. Maybe there is some variation there, but there really wouldn't be a whole lot. Yeah, not this perfect, perfect circle of exposed yeah. steel. Yeah, so what you might see is that, let's say this side here is facing the street, there might be more rust in this area, or mm. maybe the paint is more broken because there's been cars have uh, have gone in and, uh, and splashed water onto it. Yeah, and then like on some sides, maybe where the valves are, you would have some kind of dripping, like so that would create rust and some, some yeah, dirt exactly. and grime as well. Also, it, this depends heavily if this here were to be in New York City or in uh, a place like San Diego, where you know it's the the amount of rain is just vastly different. Yeah. The amount of sun. So one one hydrant, it could be the exact same hydrant from the exact same factory, would have a lot more sun damage. The other one would have more water and frost damage, for instance. Yeah, and then that's again another thing. Like you want to consider, okay, in terms of sun, how much sun does it get, and where does it get it from? Mm. It wouldn't be equal everywhere. It's like when no. you you go out and, and like look at these old recycle shops and stuff. they always have these for some reason blue posters in the store just because the sun has damaged so much that blue is the only color yeah. that remained obviously that's not going to happen as much to like a heavy duty paint like the one you see on a fire hydrant but you might still see paint starting to fade exactly. and you might see some chipping on the paint on one side because it's gotten more sun there so it's, it's, there is a lot of stuff to consider. It's not just like, oh, there's a fire hydrant. No. Like Henning's doing here, like, okay, yeah, here's the chain. The chain has probably been rattling in this area. That's why the paint has started to chip off more there. That makes sense. Yeah. You really just got to think about the story. I, I really like to think about texture painting as when you're painting textures, you, you're, not just, you're not just defining materials. You're painting a story. And every single object has a story. Maybe the story is it's a brand new iPhone from a Chinese factory. That's that's still a story, and that would show that it's it's brand new. Or it could be an iPhone which is fallen ten stories down and is absolutely smashed. Yeah, the, what do you have to think about? Like you can think about it like this: that each object, whether you're doing hard surface or you're doing organic, like you're doing characters or stuff, it's it's the same thing. Like they. They have a personality, mm. you know, their personality in terms of the objects is just what's the environment they've been in. How has that affected them? What kind of fire hydrant has it become now? <laughs> you know, is it an angry, depressed teenage <laughs> fire hydrant or, you know, 
So there's a lot of factors that play in. Owen listens to my chemical romance. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just got out of its paramour phase. Yeah. <laughs> So already, let's let's try to uh, obviously pretty shitty paint job here, but you know we just we just want to break it up a bit more and make it feel a bit more realistic. Yeah, because individual variation is really the name of the game when it comes to when it comes to texturing. I can't stress how important that is. And what you could think, about, think about is for for something like this, maybe this used to be a yellow fire hydrant, mm. so maybe there's multiple paint layers, you know, and then. Some parts of the steel is newly exposed, so that would be more shiny and steel-like. Other parts have been exposed for a long time, so maybe they're rusty. So th there's a lot of stuff that you can go through. It's not just, okay, let me just... Because I, I think one of the issues is a lot of people think about, especially for metallic objects like this, it's like, it's one layer of paint and then it rusts. No, no, this <laughs> it's so, so wrong. Like... Yeah. It rusts in different stages and not all the paint wears off at the same time. You know, it's it's there's so much variation that you can that you can think about and add to your to your objects. It's, it's not gonna be the same everywhere. I really enjoy doing this, adding just multiple layers of uh, like here, yeah, you like more inside maybe it was painted yellow underneath. You can paint yellow. Yeah, and that's a cool thing there as well. Like you have the additional bump underneath where you can still see, mm. you know, some stuff. You could have that being like the 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 bubbling of of the paint when it sort of starts to come off because of too much sun. So it's like it starts to have have oxygen in there that sort of like rises a little bit. Yeah, exactly. So there's there's so many of these small little things that you can do to your objects to just give more life to them. And then you can also supplement this with some materials here. If you want rust, there's no reason to reinvent the, the wheel here with rust. You know, you can, you can do this and you can put this under here, maybe between these two. Yeah. So now instead of, uh, instead of go, the metal, maybe you're now just seeing straight rust. Or you could go in and do the same thing. You know, you could add a mask to this, hide all the rust. Go in uh, and just, just try out different things. You know, you could paint and now you can just get some, some of the rust back. Yeah. So definitely don't just drag and drop smart <laughs> materials onto whatever it is you're doing. Think about the history of it. And then, you know, use it as a basis. Really use it as a basis. But think about the story. Try to get reference if you can. Couldn't find a whole lot of reference for the specific kind of fire, fire hydrant. But, you know, source it from real life and source it from what the object has, has gone through. Go find your own fire hydrant. And, uh, you know, maybe threaten it with a knife. I'm like, <laughs> yeah. oh, I'll make you a story. And then, uh, yeah. I do this actually a lot whenever I go around. Uh, threatening daily... fire hydrants? Yeah, threatening <laughs> fire hydrants. I take them with me home. Uh, I know I, I go around the city and uh, just take photos of materials, mm. particularly when prepping for this painter video. We've been doing that introduction. Because then you can really just look at the differences in material. You see this a lot specifically with metal, which has paint on top of it. Just You can get some very interesting variation going on with that. Yeah. So yeah, that's that's basically it for this video. If you want to see more painter content, let us know. We'd love to love to hear your thoughts on that. Also, one question I have or specific interest is: <laughs> Do you guys have any have any cool brushes? Any favorite brushes you like to use when mm. you're painting? Because there are so many of them, and I'm sure we can all figure out a good set of yeah. brushes to use here. So yeah, make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the notification button, and we'll see you next time. Thanks for watching.